Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. This is Fireside Chat, episode 58. The sick bay is full. Recorded November 3rd, 2014. Well, we're back after a very eventful Flames Week, I think is probably the best way to say it. A lot of roster movement, and as usual, we're here to cover it all and break it down for everybody. I'm Dan, along with Matt. Been an interesting week, hasn't it, Matt? Yeah, exciting play from the Flames. You can't fault when uh, you can have a good comeback victory against Nashville and smoke the Canadians. Well, let's start there, since that game was last night. We're recording this on Monday. That uh, Canadiens game was pretty amazing. Yeah, that, that was one of the most dominating performances I've seen in the last decade from the Flames, let alone since the rebuild or this season. And, you know, I mean, the Flames the Flames are an interesting team. They lost to Montreal once, now they've beat Montreal, and it wasn't just beating them. I mean, that was like French toast. They, you know, they really beat up the Canadiens, who are a very, very good team this year. Yeah, and... Like, their defense just completely shut everything that Montreal was trying to do down. Like, they had no real good scoring chances in the game. Like, even the two goals they scored were kind of oddball, weird ones. So... That's a game I think the video coach is going to be keeping close at hand for the rest of the year. Because anytime this team plays a crappy game, they're going to probably roll this game footage and say, Look guys, we can do it and we did it. Yeah, definitely. This is what we need to be, and this is the definition, I think, of Flames hockey and what this team wants to be playing like. Well, the main thing is is that like they were making lots of passes, but they were all hitting tape-to-tape tape pretty much the whole game. It was quite a nice, pleasant thing to watch. The other thing that I was noticing, too, is it was really a show of resilience there, and the veterans showing some of that resilience. There were a couple times Montreal looked like they were starting to come back. And they're starting to kind of trap the Flames. Um, Not with the trap, but they were starting to kind of push the Flames into a wall and get some offense. And the veterans would come in and kind of slow the game down a little bit and, you know, take that lead back. And that's really what you need from a veteran core, especially when you've got so many young guys. Definitely. And when Montreal scored right off the bat in the third period, that was key, in my opinion, to see how they were going to respond to that. Because that was the only real adversity that they had faced that entire game. And Montreal could have got back into it if the Flames didn't shut them down. And the Flames, to their credit, responded and then some. And, I mean, if you look at other games the Flames have won this year, you know, you look at um, the last Predators game, even some of the games that they've played against, say, when they beat Winnipeg, They didn't look like they were dominant for the majority of the game. Often it looked like the other team was setting the pace, and Calgary was almost trying to keep up to that. Where in this game, I mean, not only did we take on a world-class goaltender and show that the team can light them up, the Flames really came out and set the pace and made the Canadians, I thought, play their game. Yeah, and the Flames just simply outskated and outworked them, which is amazing considering Montreal's one of the best skating teams in the league. For sure. I'm going to be really interested to see how they can take that momentum into the Washington game tomorrow because we didn't have good success against Washington last time we played them. We lost 3-1. to one. So it'll be interesting to see how they'll ride that wave of momentum. Mm-hmm. Washington also plays a very tight defensive style since they've added Barry Trotz as their coach. So it'll be interesting to see if they can continue their offensive outburst against a very tight checking team. I was listening to Overtime last night on Fan 960, and I generally don't listen to Overtime. It's kind of a rule I have, but, you know, I was riding the high and that sort of thing. A lot of people are talking about this team making the postseason. I personally don't think they're going to. I think there's going to be a lot of stuff standing in our way, especially the very powerful Western Conference, but what do you think? Well, it'll be tough. Like, even though the Flames have played the best hockey that they've played since at least the start of the rebuild, they're still only a couple of points up from being out of the playoffs entirely. So while they've been great, like they have to keep this up for another 70 games, and I don't know if they can do it. They might. I can't read the future and see exactly how this will turn out, 
but they have been quite excellent for the, at least the last little while anyway. I mean, if you look at the Western Conference this year, we've got the Ducks, who are a real powerhouse. Nashville's looking good. Uh, Vancouver's not doing too bad. San Jose, St. Louis, I think, is going to move up in the standings. They're sixth right now. I don't think there's a lot of room to break into that top eight. LA's a top team. I think they're only going to get better. So I think the Flames not only have to stay doing what they're doing, but they're going to have to get even better in order to stay in this top eight for the long term. Yeah, and especially with the upcoming streak that they have of games between now and christmas they only play three week teams out of like the next 23 games so it's gonna be a really tough ride if they reach that point and like they're still a top five team in the west then yeah they probably could make the playoffs but we won't really know if that'll be a feasibility until then. Yeah, I think that'll be a good marker, is looking at how this team does through November and December as well, and kind of gauging after that. But I think the team can probably stay about playing where they are, perhaps. I don't know that there's a lot of potential to go up for this team. And if the other teams that are above us play the way they're expected to, the Western Conference is going to be tough to break a top eight spot in this year. Well, I don't think the Flames have that much room to go up. I think the Flames right now in the standings are fourth. Well, yeah, I mean fourth right now, but as other teams get better, I mean they're going to have to you know, raise their level of play. Oh, yeah. I know. I'm just giving you a hard time. But, yeah, it's uh, we'll see. It'll be, an, it'll be an interesting conversation. The big story this week, all the players in the sick bay. Uh, the Flames, it seems, every year get hit with injuries. And it always seems like the big rash of injuries comes at the end of the year. So I'm glad it's coming early this year. It's almost like if we can get this done and over with, we can move on. But recapping the injuries we've got right now, uh, Mason Raymond was put on the IR on October 27th. He's listed week to week. Uh, Matt Stajan has a knee injury. They'll keep him out six weeks. Joel Colborn has an upper body injury. He's listed day to day. Michael Backlund has an undisclosed injury. He's week to week. And one of the new call-ups, Michael Furland, has a concussion. He's day to day. Well, Backlund, uh, he had an abdominal issue. Oh, did he? Okay, that's it's, the reason why he's. It's officially out. listed as undisclosed, so I wasn't sure if the abdominal thing was just a guess or if they'd actually confirmed that. And then, because of the rash of forwards that are out, one, two, three, four forwards, the Flames had to dip into their pool of Adirondack talent in order to fill some of those holes. Josh Juris was already here, but Sven Berchi, Michael Furland, and Marcus Granlin were brought up from the farm. All looking really good so far. Let's break them down one at a time. Uh, let's start with Sven, the guy I guess we all expected to be here. Um, he only played the game in Montreal, and to me I thought that he was really underwhelming. Well, he did have that one scoring chance, and he was also one of the least played forwards. I think he had the lowest ice time of anybody, so it's hard to get a real gauge on him when he was only, I think he only played like nine minutes yesterday. It is what it is. You hope that he'll come around. He was playing better in Adirondack. Earlier in the week, he had a pair of assists. Berchi had 10 minutes, 49 seconds time on ice in that game. He was also a last minute call up too, so it's you know probably a lot harder when you're called up the day of to get here, get through your game routine, and that sort of thing. Well, he played Saturday in Adirondack and then had to drive three hours to Montreal and arrived at like two in the morning prior to the game. So it's not the best barometer that game. It'll be more telling how he plays the remainder of this week. For sure, and I wouldn't write him off, I think, it was easy for a lot of people to criticize one performance in Montreal. But like you said, we have to watch him throughout the week to see how he does. I didn't think he played the best game that he could have, and maybe we're comparing him to some of the other call-ups who had very, very good games. But he didn't. He wasn't the worst guy on the ice by any means. No. So the next guy that they called up, um, a player who made his NHL debut this year, and that's Michael Furland. He's worked hard, he had a great camp, and he got rewarded with the call-up. Uh, what do you think of what we've seen from Furland so far? I just wish that he didn't get a concussion from Anton Volchenkov. He was very good. Both him and Granlund showed excellent chemistry and were probably the most dangerous line for the first two periods against Nashville. Yeah, it's too bad in his first game up that he gets a concussion. That's never a great way to start your pro career. Um, he looked good. I think it's good that they put him on a line for most of the game with Marcus Granlin. 
I think that really helps, um, you know, him kind of with the adjustment and Granlin with the adjustment too, having a familiar face on their line. I thought those two together, I couldn't really single out one guy over the other a lot in that game, but the two of them together, you could tell had some chemistry, and I thought that that worked really well for the team. But I hope Ferland's back soon. I hope his concussion clears up because I want to see more of this kid. Yeah, and in Adirondack, they were actually on the same line down there, and they were... For the first, like, six or seven games, they were the only line that was consistently scoring. Who was the third guy on that line? Uh, I think it was Reinhardt, but for some reason, like, the plays would always end up being Furland and Granlund together getting the points, because, like, Reinhardt only had one assist through the first, like, eight games. Yeah. No, that makes sense. It was kind of bizarre. <laughs> so, yeah, it's good that they brought both those guys up. Next guy we'll chat about is a guy that I've liked since we acquired him, a guy that I've always thought was going to make this team hopefully he's going to stay here but sooner rather than later and that's Marcus Granlin who came up uh Furland's counterpart the weird thing and it took me a while to go back and look at the stats but Granlin's only 21 this kid's still really young and has a lot of potential to him Mm -hmm. and he's already tallied a goal and an assist in his uh two games since he got recalled and he had three in seven games last year so He's showing that he can be a decent contributor offensively. I just like how he he's very poised at both ends of the ice. Like, it's not like he's just a, gonna go and get you a goal. He actually gets back and plays the right way defensively as well. And that two-way game will make him a very good NHLer for a long time. Yeah, and uh, going along with the poise, one of the things I have in my notes here is his hockey sense. Like, he always seems to know exactly where he should be, and he doesn't get beat with, you know, pucks going around him or him being out of position a lot. From the two games I've seen him up this year, from what I remember last year, and from the AHL games I've seen, he knows this game well, and he can think the game very well, especially for someone as young as he is. Yeah, and when he was put on the line with uh, Johnny Gaudreau and Yuri Hoodler, it was instant chemistry because all three of those players are very intelligent yeah. on the ice. And, and he was able to adapt very quickly to his line mates. Yeah, and every shift, they were consistently extremely dangerous. Definitely it helps having good line mates to foster his own development as well. Yeah, and that's the thing is, you know, being up in the NHL for these guys... It sucks for Adirondack, who's trying to string some wins together to lose all their top players, but it's going to be really good for these guys' development. Well, amusingly, after uh, they recalled Granlund and then Furland, the Adirondack Flames have scored 11 goals in the two games, and I don't even think they had that in all the games prior. <laughs> so, go figure. Yeah, I know. I was I was watching their, uh, their game against the Rampage, the 7-6 win, and I watched the second uh, Canadian or the Americans game, the 7-3 win. So those those were pretty exciting games to watch. Next guy on this list, and it's funny, there seems to be this, uh, I wouldn't say a curse, but it's not. It's whatever the good kind of curse is, but there seems to be some mojo that comes with being benched for a game and then coming back. We saw that after Goudreau got benched for a game and came back, he looked like a phenom. And then Josh Juris gets benched for a game and comes back against the Canadian and has a fantastic game. Um, Josh Juris, if you would have told me last year he would be the first recall and that he'd be playing as well as he was, I would have thought that you were you were pulling my leg. Well, four points in six games since he was recalled earlier in the season. He has not looked out of place at all. I think he could be a very good third-line type that can chip in some offense. He definitely knows what to do when he gets a breakaway. Like, how cool is that for him to score two breakaway goals against a Vesna winner in Sergei Bobrovsky and then against one of the best goalies in the world, Carey Price? Yeah, I know. I was I was watching him on that price goal, and I was, you know, he's almost the underdog, right? The call-up player who nobody expected to be here. And I was rooting for him. Come on, you can get it past him. And he did. And, you know, it, it's cool to see on the score sheet, Juris getting two goals against Price, and I was really hoping he'd get a third one because I wanted him to get that hat trick. Not only beat him once, not only beat him twice, but I was really hoping he was going to get the hat trick against Price. Oh, I'm glad that he's finding his way up here with his speed and overall skills he definitely could become a solid contributor down the road especially 
You know, one of the things that I was thinking about last night when I was looking at Juris's play and thinking about this roster is as the, as the roster starts to get healthy, Raymond, Stajan, Colborn, Backlund, I'm really hoping that some of these call-ups, I think Juris especially, are going to give uh, True Living a very tough decision to make. And to me, that's what you want in a rebuild. You want management to say, these kids have earned a slot. How do I make them have that slot they need yeah and the onus is on the kids to come in and say no this spot is mine and Juris in my opinion he has done that and I think Grandland has as well and we've all seen what Gaudreau's done well Gaudreau was given a spot right out of opening day yeah I know but he's definitely after he got benched for the one game has really solidified that he's gonna be here to stay for a long time now you have the problem of okay now we have like 15 or 16 forwards that are all NHL ish caliber and the kids are staying so now what what a great problem to have, though. Oh, definitely. Like, as a GM of all the things you'd want to wake up and have a problem with, what a fantastic problem to have, especially in a rebuilding year. I have too many players who are good enough to be on my 23-man roster. Exactly. It would be a bit hugely different story if, say, Juris and Granlund and Berchi and Furland came up and stunk up the joint. But they haven't. They've looked mostly NHL-ready. Berchi is a little bit behind, but not by much. It's a good thing, and you have to evaluate, okay, well, if those guys are going to stay, who am I going to move of the remainder? Does that mean uh, David Jones gets traded? Do you leave Brian McGratton off the sheet? Do you send down Setaguchi? That's more of the conversation now. And I'd love to see, I mean, I don't know what Hartley or Trilliving or any of the coaching staff are going to use for motivation, but I'd love to be on the fly on the wall when the conversation happens with somebody like a Devin Setaguchi of, you know what, this Juris kid is going to take your job. You know, like he's here, he's gunning for it. We've got him higher on the depth chart. Show us that you deserve it. Oh, yeah. And while the five players are out, This is an audition for the veterans as well, because the kids have shown them up, really. And, okay, your job is going to be gone in a week or two when the the rest of the guys get back, so step it up. And you and I talked about this in some of our uh, preseason shows, but this is what we wanted. We didn't want positions to just be handed to the kids because we should get younger because it's a rebuild. We said that we wanted guys like Setaguchi to kind of be the yardstick. If you got to do this to keep a slot on this team. And I hope that we're going to see that. A guy like Juris come in, play a fantastic you know, audition, and force the team to keep him there and figure out a way to do that. Even if it means losing a player like Setaguchi to waivers or something like that, he's, he's forced his way onto the team. Yeah, and that's the whole part of going through the rebuilding process is finding guys like Juris who kind of came out of nowhere really and they can come in and take a job and be effective and not just be a fill-in roster spot like what Edmonton had with some of their players like Liam Reddix and a few others that oh, you're young, let's throw you in. (laughs) Yeah, and, you know, that's that's exactly what we need is those unlikely guys to come out like Juris and emerge and make it really hard. And it's going to be interesting to see, and as we start getting some of these players back, like I said, who stays here and who goes? Yeah, that'll be up to management. There are some players that are better candidates to get traded or waived, like Setaguchi, Jones, and McGratton than others but who knows like maybe somebody offers you a first round pick or a second round pick for glenn cross you don't know yeah and who knows what management's already doing or has in the works knowing we have to free up a roster spot soon so let's start working some deals it'll be interesting to cover over the next little while anyway oh for sure you know after what we've seen with uh juris sitting for a game and then having a great game and goudreau sitting for a game and then having a great game I wonder if there's going to be guys in the dressing room starting to say, Coach, can I sit out for a game, please? That'd be a very odd thing, but why not? (laughs) Well, we we do have enough forwards, though, that someone's got to sit every game. 
So, hey, coach, I'm slumping. Can I sit for a game? I promise I'll come back better. Look at the other guys. Maybe there's some magic to sit in the Flames press box. Why not? <laughs> it's been blessed with some sort of magic. Too. Yeah. Who knows? Having people wanting to sit out, I think that would be a first for anybody. Well, not sitting out the whole season. Taking one game off. No, I know. I know. So, Matt, I'm... About ready to admit that I was wrong at the beginning of the year when we did our lineups. I said that I think that Johnny Gaudreau should go down to the HL because I didn't think he was ready for the NHL. And at the beginning, it looked like I was right. But after, again, he sat out his one game and he came back. He's looked fantastic since then. Kid's got eight points in 12 games right now. He's a plus seven. He's not looking like a rookie on the ice out there. He's looking like a kid who's done this for a while. Yeah, in each of the last three games, twice against the Canadians and against the Predators, he's been the most dangerous player on the ice from either team. Every game, every shift, you notice Gaudreau's out and like the other team's like, okay, batting down the hatches because he's coming. And he's been simply amazing. Like, I didn't think he'd be able to play at that level so soon. Like, I thought he was going to have a bit of a hiccup and be more of like a second line guy, not the best guy on the ice every game. And he's definitely even proved me wrong. I didn't expect that level of play from him at all this year, really. So he's just been amazing. And I think that if he keeps it up, he'll be getting some silverware at the end of the year. Well, let's talk about that. So if you look at rookies in the league, I don't think there's many guys out there that are, as as of right now, still early in the league, but a better candidate for the uh, Calder Trophy for best rookie than Johnny Gaudreau. Yeah, there's a few guys like Tanner Pearson that aren't That's doing... the only other guy I'm thinking of who would probably be in that running right now. Yeah, and if you look at the past draft, like there's nobody that's up that's a dangerous threat from the 2014 picks. So it's a bit of a down year per se for rookies. Like there's no Nathan McKinnon in the lineup. So he definitely has a good shot at it. And if he can even put up 50 to 60 points at the end of the year, I don't see how he doesn't walk away with the Flames, I believe, sixth Calder trophy. And the first one in a while. Yeah. I mean, most of them came in the 80s. Yeah. I think Makarov was the last one. The worry I have about that with Gaudreau is because he's used to playing a very short season in college. I'm worried that we might see at some point during the year him start to get gassed around Christmas time. I, I wonder if he's just going to run out of gas and almost need to sit for a couple games to re-energize himself because he's not used to an 82-game season. No. Well, if need be, the magical press box will be there <laughs> to allow him to rest up for a bit. Like, as you said, I don't see him playing every game just because of that, but if he can keep it up, That'd be fantastic. Yeah, and, and I think that's going to be one of the big challenges there is to see how Goudreau plays out over an 82-game schedule. The most fascinating story, I think, of this season will be pretty much what he does every game. And, you know, every time I watch him and I watch Johnny play and I look at the way he's playing, and then you look at where he was drafted, he's a fourth round pick. You know, I know, you know, he had some size issues and that sort of thing, but if you look at this, the Flames are getting this out of a fourth round pick. And for all the people that said we weren't drafting well during that period, that's a diamond in the rough there for the Flames. I know. And then you look at TJ Brody, who's also a fourth round pick, and makes you want the Flames to trade more assets to get fourth rounders because they seem to be working lately. Well, I think one thing that's coming out of that is the Flames may not have got a lot of high-profile first-round guys or high-profile second-round guys, but they were able to scout the depth players in the draft and know which ones to go after. I am just thrilled that we've managed to find some guys in the later rounds that are fleshing out the roster. Even guys like Marcus Granlund, Michael Furland, even Juris, all of whom were not first-round selections, you need to hit the mark on guys in the later rounds in order to get through a rebuild successfully. Like, if you've looked at Edmonton, they pretty much hit on an, most of their first-round picks, but once you get into the second round beyond, it's a graveyard for their drafts. So it's encouraging that we are getting the, these kind of performances from those depth players. Well, I can't remember the last team that's gone through an actual rebuild like the Flames 
who have relied on depth players. I mean, really, if you look at the guys we're relying on to kind of be the, you know, guys that are going to come out of this as superstars or even that are going to help us through this year, it's going to be the guys like uh, TJ Brody. It's going to be the guys like Johnny Gaudreau. Um, And I can't remember the last time a team looked at this and had so many guys outside of the top 60 or even top 90 who you were saying, wow, these are going to be the guys to watch coming out of the rebuild. I know. It's kind of amazing. I just hope that the other top picks, Poirier, Klimchuk, Monaghan, and Bennett can all contribute to the level that they're supposed to as well. <laughs> well, that's the crazy thing. Like, we haven't even seen Sam Bennett in a flaming sea yet. Oh, I know. You know, Klimchuk, Poirier, they're coming, but Sam Bennett we have yet to even see. So I was just thinking about all this stuff on the weekend, and it's it's crazy. Like, this team is right now dripping with potential and i love it oh i know that's why like in 2013 and 2014 in july when the flames had their rookie camps like i was freaking out at like how many awesome players they had and now we're actually starting to see at the nhl level these guys coming up and this was the level of talent i was seeing over at Winsport then it's coming and there's a lot more from just the handful of guys that we have up now there's still a lot more guys down on the farm that are just as good yeah and i think for you know last year there's so much optimism around this team but i think if we look at what we've got in the system and the guys we've got coming up or potentially coming up this year there's so much to be excited about as a Flames fan going forward. Yeah, like this rebuild I don't think is going to take that much longer. Like I think we're likely going to get a top 10 pick this year, and then we might even make the playoffs next year. If you get a healthy Sam Bennett in there and you sign a free agent or two, like I think you could pretty much be ready to go next year. We'll definitely find out. Like it's fun. You know, it's encouraging instead of, like, Edmonton's perpetual suckage. Speaking of Edmonton's perpetual suckage, uh, Edmonton has four wins in a row now against the Eastern Conference, but they haven't been able to beat a team in the West yet. Even Carolina beat Phoenix, Arizona, my mistake. (laughs) So now every team in the NHL has a win against the Western Conference except for the Edmonton Oilers. It shows you the difference in level between East and West this year. How can they be this bad? Like, I, I am mystified at how bad the Oilers are. And it's not it's not like, you know, some of these teams that have, like, Carolina has generally been a good team, and now all of a sudden they've gone downhill. They've been this way for so long, and that's the part that mystifies me. Yeah, well, like, even Buffalo, they were really good for, like, five or six years You're there. Right. Yeah, they were a team that I envied for a while. Yeah, and then they sold off everybody and are going through a rebuild. And that's the natural cycle of things. But Edmonton has been terrible since ever, really. Like, even uh, when they went to the finals in 06... They were the 8th seed, and they barely got there, and if it wasn't for the overtime points, they wouldn't have got there. So, they've been really terrible for at least the last 10-15 years, and how are you still this bad? And then how does the management still have jobs? Like, that is the other mystifying thing. Yeah, well, I guess all we can do is be happy that's not us. Yeah, definitely. And, and And you know what? I was worried at the beginning of this year that we might finish lower than them, but right now we're in a place where we can, you know, look at them and and make ourselves feel a lot better that that's not us. Yeah, it's getting to the point where I actually feel sorry for their fans having to endure that. And then they lost Taylor Hall, their only really good player, for two weeks to a month. And, like, I don't know if they they might get McDavid at this rate. Like, unbelievable. Just what they need, another top centerman. Yeah. Well, at least it's not us. Yeah. Well, honestly, if they do get one of the top picks, I'll actually wonder if that player will demand a trade. Because, honestly, if I'm... Pulling Eric Lindros and refuse to play for them? Well, honestly, if you're a player and you see the track record of all these other top players that have gone to Edmonton and how they've been screwed up, wouldn't you want to go somewhere else? Well, anywhere else. Interesting draft interview. Sit there. You know what? You really don't want me. Pick Hannafin or somebody. Don't pick me. You don't want me. My knee hurts today. It might be a liability. <laughs> I can't do a pull-up. <laughs> 
<laughs> maybe you could do that. You could just throw the combine so they don't pick you. Yeah, pull a Sam Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you never know. But yeah, I'd be doing everything I could to get out of uh, wearing the black and orange or the blue and orange. Yeah, at least until they change management. Like if they get some actual people that understand how hockey is played in the 21st century that you know it's not 1980 it's an embarrassment well let's go back to talking about this team getting better our team because you know there's only so much we can talk about with the uh with the oilers and just shake our heads at but we're talking about how this team's looking better and they might you think perhaps be in the playoffs next year but one thing we found in the modern NHL is you can't be a playoff team without having a starting goaltender and it seems as though the Flames may finally have their starting goaltender this year. Um, as we know, they were going one and one with Ramo and Hiller all year. And it looks as though Jonas Hiller has pulled ahead. And it looks like they're starting to give him the starting job. Yeah, and he's been great. There, There's only so much you can say when you're getting Kipper-esque levels of goaltending. And he's been phenomenal for us well that was the thing i said in the off season too is we have to temper our expectations this is not mika kiprasov you know this this is not um the guy that we've got to know and Jonas hiller is coming off a bad year but i think that he's he's been fantastic and i've even heard some fans saying the goaltending for the flames is going to cost us um mcdavid or eichel or hannafin but i think to me I don't know that the Flames would be doing as well as they're doing right now if it wasn't for having those strong goaltenders in net. Well, you add the defense on top of Hiller and, to a slightly lesser extent, Ramo, and, yeah, it will end up causing the Flames to win more games. But, honestly, I would rather them be doing things right than get the top pick. Yes, we're rebuilding and all that, but especially with this draft, there are enough guys that it really doesn't matter as long as we're in the top 10 to 12 picks we'll get a good player and even looking at teams like carolina florida buffalo and edmonton honestly i don't think we would have got a top five pick even if hiller and ramo were playing terribly anyway so no and i agree and you know to me goaltending is that key piece that every team's looking for very few teams actually get so if we've got great goaltending, let's run with it. And, you know, let's make sure that we're giving these guys what they need. And you were mentioning the defense. I think the defense is partly playing as well as they are because they're confident in their net minder. They're confident they're not having to clean up a mess when the puck gets near the net. I think the goaltender is confident because he knows the defense has got his back. So it's all one of these symbiotic relationships that's going on. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that in addition to the goaltenders playing well, guys like Chris Russell, Dennis Weidman, Brody, and Giordano, they've played probably their best hockey of their entire careers, all of them. So that's also encouraging because we're getting that level of performance. And like with Giordano and Brody, they're probably one of the top three defense pairings in the entire NHL at this point, if not the best. I think they may also be one of the best defense pairings in recent NHL memory. I mean, people are comparing them to the uh, to the Seabrook Keith pairing. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing is that usually when you're getting an offensive defenseman like what Brody and Giordano have been doing, usually their defense is not as good. But as good as they've been offensively, I think they've actually been better defensively. We saw that against Montreal, where every time they were out there, like the Flames are off on an offensive chance. What I like about those two is they seem like they can adapt to what the team needs. When the team needs offensive defensemen... They're there to do that. When the team needs guys to to stay at home and hang back, they're there to do that. They're it seems this year able to adapt to whatever it is the Flames need them to be when they need them to be it. Mm -hmm. And who would have figured that uh, the top one of the top pairings in the NHL would consist of a UFA signing defenseman that didn't even get drafted and a fourth round pick. <laughs> Shows the Flames good development. Yeah. I I just hope that the, the Flames can have similar levels of development with their forward prospects as they come up. And if that's the case, then the Flames might be a contender in a couple of years for the Stanley Cup, let alone just being a good playoff team. Yeah. Well, and, and I think, you know, 
it's making every day. It's making that TJ Brody contract seem so much of a better value every day we see this team together. I know every time I see Brody out there, I'm thinking, "Wow, this contract is going to be the best value in the league." Oh yeah, definitely. The fact that like those two players are combined are making less than nine million dollars is absolutely ridiculous. And I think too, that's the. I mean, I've I've never talked to an NHL player about it, but I think having a defensive pairing like that, that's the kind of things that starts to make Calgary an attractive market to come play in. Oh yeah, and the fact that the Flames have the second lowest payroll of any team in the NHL uh, once UFA day comes and if the flames finish respectably this year I could definitely see them attracting the Parise suitor type UFAs because we are on the rise and oh I want to go there because they are doing things the right way and this team will be a contender yeah, and I want to get on the ground floor of this team. Yeah, and well, wouldn't you? You know, they the Flames are the hardest working team in the league, and they've got Gaudreau, they've got Bennett, they've got Monahan, they've got Brody. So you know, if you add uh, like an Aginla level of player to that, then you're starting to get the foundation of a really solid contending team for sure it's interesting that you mentioned the hard work i mean this has been the identity of this team for a while the hard working kind of blue collar team has been the identity of the flames really since the run in 04 and more and more as i look at the makeup of this team i know that when we ran sutter out of town everybody said they wanted nothing to do with him but the more i look at this team and the way they're playing and the way they're made up it still seems like a Daryl Sutter team to me. I mean, it's not a bunch of Western Canadian boys, but it still seems like it's that hardworking, blue-collar guys who would just go out there and get it done and play whatever roles needed to do it and adapt to whatever they need. If they need to be gritty, they'll do that. If they need to just go put a bunch of shots on net, they'll do that. The key to contending teams is being able to be versatile enough to play in every different way and do it well. And... Like, if you want to drop the mitts and let's go, okay. If you want to play a fast-skating finesse game, okay. Yeah. You you need to have that availability to be able to beat you in different ways. Because sometimes you're not going to be able to play, you know, like things won't click for you if you're playing a certain way. But if you can be adaptable, you can modify how you're playing to respond to your opponent. And especially over an 82-game schedule, the opponents will be playing in different styles. So having that flexibility will be advantageous moving forward. And, you know, I've been reading media from around the league, from other teams and that sort of thing. And people are saying that teams are... And this has, you know, been the case for a couple of years, but I think even more so this year than in recent memory, teams don't want to come here. They don't want to play the Flames because they know they're going to have to work hard. They're all, they don't want to, you know take on what this team's got and when you have teams coming here that don't want to play us because they know how hard we work that's what the calgary flames identity is right now and i think that's fantastic that already in this young season players and coaches are starting to say that yeah and they have to realize that they might be able to out talent us to a victory but they're gonna have to work for every inch of ice and that is huge for when this team actually does make the playoffs down the road because you do need to work outwork your opposition well even this year i mean we haven't really been blown out in any game so far and i think that if we can be that team that everybody knows even if we don't make the playoffs if you come here you're gonna have to work for two points and you're gonna have to work hard we almost become the gatekeepers to a top eight spot in a way Mm -hmm. if you can come here and you can get two points every time you play this team you're a hard-working team. You probably deserve to, you know, move up the standings. Yeah, you're not going to get an easy two points, like, if you go no. up to Edmonton. And I think even if we're not high in the standings, that's one thing that's going to set us apart from the other teams near the bottom of the pack. No, and plus, with getting that reputation for being that type of team, that will help also with free agents because, hey, they're doing the right thing i want to go there well and the nice thing too is i think it automatically starts to filter some free agents out if there's guys that don't want to work hard or you know just want to be the number one guy on a team that's kind of lackadaisical yeah the alex semen type 
guys. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of who I was thinking of. They're going to know. They're going to tell their agent, don't take Calgary's calls. I don't want to play there. That's not a team that I want to be on. So the guys that are going to phone you or that are going to take your phone calls are going to be the guys that want to work hard. Mm -hmm. And that also helps because you're going to be getting the right fits. It can do nothing but good. Yeah. Well, everybody's heard what we've thought about this team for uh, the last about 45 minutes here. Um, But we also want to know what everyone else thinks of this team. We want everyone in the Sea of Red to join the conversation. Join us in talking about the Flames and celebrating everything that's good about this team right now. Uh, if you go to our website, firesidechat.ca slash conversation, in your web browser, there's multiple ways that you can join the conversation. Give us your feedback. You can call into the show on your computer. You can send us an email from that page. Or, as usual, we always uh, say that you can get a hold of us on Facebook or Twitter. We'd love to have everybody give us their thoughts. Join the conversation. Tell us what you thought of the Montreal game. Tell us if you thought think that uh, that uh, Johnny Gaudreau can, you know, be the call, can walk away with the Calder Cup this year. It's up to all of us to talk about this team and celebrate the team. And Matt and I don't want to do it alone. We want to hear from everybody else. Yeah, different opinions always help. And they're greatly encouraged. (laughs) And, you know, I I know myself after the Montreal game, I just, I wanted to talk about the Flames today. And at work, I would talk about anyone who wanted to talk about it. So if you're like that, where you're just so full of energy about this team, come talk to us. Talk about some like-minded people. We'd love to get you on the show, either your voice or or your thoughts through email. Let's let's all have a chat about this team and see how we're going to do this coming week. Yeah, we've got a busy schedule this week. We play between now and the next show the Washington Capitals, Tampa Bay Lightning, an afternoon affair against the Florida Panthers and the Carolina Hurricanes. You're a Panthers fan. You think we can beat the Panthers? blindfolded with our hands tied behind our back <laughs> that, that that should be an easy one i think yeah. the panthers would be an easy one uh we beat the lightning already no we didn't um, lost in overtime oh right right yeah we it was a 2-1 overtime loss so we didn't beat the lightning we didn't beat the capitals so we got two games here where we got some approve and i think that the saturday afternoon game is going to be an easy saturday for these guys really they and then the game after that is the uh hurricanes. carolina hurricanes again yeah. So if they can get through uh, the Washington Capitals and the Tampa Bay Lightning, they got a couple easy games and they got some time off. Yeah, honestly, I think they could take three or or four out of four with their opponents. It's an yeah, easier well, it, week. If, if, yeah, if we look at it until next Monday, which when we record again, we got the Capitals, the Lightning, and the Panthers. I think we can do at least uh, four points of those possible six. Yeah. It'll be good. Especially coming off the high from the Montreal game, I think that Washington's in for a bigger fight than they probably bargained for. It'll be definitely interesting to see. Well, let's see how this week goes. Go Flames go, and we'll talk to everybody next week. Take care, everybody. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.